I thought that that uh, song was maybe for me, but shake out. It wasn't. It, well, that's cool. That, that's new. That was new since uh, last time I saw you guys. My name's Eric Peterson. I'm the pastor at the Church of Benjamin's Hope, and many of you all know that because when you were kind of people in exile between Riesland and this place, you worshipped in our place, which was really awesome. So not this past summer, the summer before, we hosted the Foundry Church, and that was a beautiful relationship. And some of you may not know that, uh, that there's a missional connection and partnership between the Foundry Church and the Church of Benjamin's Hope. Uh, you're a financial supporter of our work, which is really amazing. Eric and I have a, a strong connection and gospel partnership. We, we swap pulpits a little bit. So Eric preached at the Church of Benjamin's Hope last week. I'm preaching here this week, and uh, I'm actually on kind of the, the governance team for this church as well. So it's a wonderful gospel partnership, and I'm so privileged to be here uh, leading in worship today and uh, being used of the Lord in your series, Redeeming Christmas. And an exci- it's an exciting series that you guys are all in, uh, basically taking some of the current kind of cultural icons or practices that we get so focused on in the Christmas time of year and trying to, to look at the roots of those things and really redeem them for the true meaning of Christmas, which is uh, kind of what we're all trying to focus on. It's a battle. It's a challenge in today's culture to focus on the, the birth of Christ, why he came. So we're kind of doing this series called Redeeming Christmas. So we're going to start with a little kind of name that tune. So I asked Amber to stay up, and she's going to play just like a couple bars of a song, and we're going to see if you guys can kind of name that tune because it's going to give a little hint on what our redeeming Christmas theme is for today. So, Ah, so you guys got it already. I, everybody would say, oh, Christmas tree, right? Thank you so much, Amber. That was awesome. So, oh, Christmas tree, we're obviously thinking about the Christmas tree. And you know, like I actually looked up the words to that song um, this week, and I always remembered it as, oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. But apparently, that's not the words to the song at all. I just heard it that way. The words go like this, oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, thy leaves are so unchanging, not only green when summer's here, but also when tis cold and drear. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, thy leaves are so unchanging. And you know, the Christmas tree has like this sort of iconic place in many of our Christmas traditions. And I thought it'd be fun to kind of give you a little throwback to some of my Christmas tree photos from years gone by. So here's the first one. This is my kids, Claire and Jacob. (laughs) Look at Jake there. He is like, what is going on? So Jake, it's Jacob's first Christmas and Claire's third Christmas in front of our Christmas tree. So we lived in Granville, Michigan at the time. I was a youth pastor at Zion Reformed Church. So it's kind of a fun picture of Claire and Jake. I don't know, man. He is looking really surprised, isn't he? It's like, what is going on at Christmas? So here's a throwback. You know, that's me on the left there. Isn't that nice? That's uh, probably our my wife and I, Jen, right behind me, our first Christmas married together. She would be horrified that I'm sharing this picture, by the way. Um, I probably still own that sweater, which is a really sad part of, of me. And look, my dad and I clearly dressed the same. I got my fashion sense from my father, obviously. And so we're in front of the Christmas tree at my family home. And then this next one doesn't have anything to do with a Christmas tree. It's just a funny picture from my senior year in high school. I apparently loved the turtleneck, right? So look at that. Turtleneck, turtleneck. I'm not wearing a turtleneck today, thankfully. All, nothing against turtlenecks if you have one on today. But. And I got my, my pants, that, you know, in, in 1989, tight rolling your pants at the bottom. Anybody else do that? Anybody else tight roll their jeans? That's right, so you're probably about 45 also because that was the time. So, so I thought those would be kind of some fun, kind of just a trip down memory lane kind of in front of the Christmas tree because we've all got those pictures, right, where the family's gathered in front of the tree. So I thought I'd give us just a little brief history of the Christmas tree because a lot of us don't really know exactly why that kind of tradition 
started. And I did a lot of reading on that this week in preparation for this message. I found a blog post that captures a lot of this really well. So the easiest way for me to do that is I'm just going to read this. This was put out by a, a seminary classmate of mine, Tim Breen, and he says this. Most historians agree that the winter tradition of bringing evergreens into one's home predates Jesus even. For centuries BCE, ancient peoples, especially those living in southern Europe and Italy, adorned their homes with fir, pine, and spruce, spruce branches as reminders of the warmer times of the year. Decorating their windows and mantles with green evidently cheered them up when the outdoors was all brown and white. So that's kind of how it started. People bringing evergreens inside even before Jesus. While it's likely that some of these practices were connected with ancient pagan traditions, by the Middle Ages, Christian missionaries in Europe had declared these symbols to be under the lordship of Jesus. So a lot of our kind of traditions that maybe had pagan roots in the Middle Ages, the Christians kind of said, hey, let's take those and redeem them for Christ. That's kind of why we're doing this series, to kind of focus on some of that redemptive work. So the 8th century missionary Boniface, he cut down an oak tree sacred to the Norse god Thor, and he redirected his attention, or people's attention, to the fir tree that was behind it, whose greenness Boniface considered symbolic of God's mercy. A later legend suggested that at the birth of Christ, every tree around the world miraculously shook off its snow and produced new green shoots. And then people started taking trees inside. Many scholars think that that practice gained popularity in Renaissance times when Europeans began taking uh, trees inside and hanging fruits and nuts on them, and they called them paradise trees to kind of focus on the tree, from, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And then there's this other story of Martin Luther, kind of walking, kind of the, the father of the Renaissance, right? Um, walking, or the Renaissance, the Reformation, walking through uh, the forest and looking up and seeing kind of the starlight through some pine trees. And it said that he was the first one to take candles and put them on a pine tree as kind of a, a memory of this feeling of kind of being connected with God through that experience that he had. And then the, the traditions go on of how it came to America and how electric lights replaced candles, etc. So there's this whole history of the Christmas tree. But what we want to focus on this morning is how can we understand the gospel or the good news of Jesus by thinking about trees? Because you may not know it, but, but trees pray, play an amazing role in the story of Scripture, the grand narrative of the Bible has a number of significant trees that are really central to that story. And so what we're thinking about is, I want to tell the gospel or the story of the gospel through three different trees. But before we do that, would you pray with me? God, as we think about your word, as we reflect on it, as we hear it, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, but more than ears to hear, Lord, that you give us hearts to understand. Uh, Lord, if there's anybody here this morning that does not yet know you, Jesus, as Savior and Lord, that you would draw them to yourself today. Um, help them to hear this good news through the story of these trees. We trust you and we thank you and we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the three trees that we're going to think about this morning, can you guys say it with me? The tree of life the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of the cross. So those three trees, we're going to kind of tell the gospel narrative through those. So it starts with the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And those two trees were at the very start of the story of Scripture. Most of us know that because we, we kind of learned growing up about this story but we're going to hear it again this morning. In Genesis 2, the, the creation narrative says this, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree 
that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then later it says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we see this tree of life and this tree of knowledge of good and evil are kind of central to some of the first commands of God to his first people, Adam and Eve. But then we see just a few short verses later in the very next chapter of Scripture, we find the serpent kind of entering the scene, right? And we even talked about it this morning, how how there is an enemy of our souls that's trying to kind of direct us away from God's good word and God's good will. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the, tr- the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate and then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And so we find the very start of the story of Scripture, these two trees, the tree of life, which which signifies the life and connection and relationship and eternal, eternal nature with which the first people were given life. That's what we see, and they were free to eat of that tree, right? They were free to eat of the tree to maintain their eternal life, and to to be in relationship with God. And yet, because God wanted to create people with free will and choice, he also put this tree in the midst of the garden that he gave them a clear command not to eat, and they disobeyed God, and they being we, because we're all part of that same line and lineage, we disobeyed God, and we've gone our own way. And there was a a separation, and a disconnection. This is the very kind of foundation of what we know to be why we need Jesus, because we were created, connected with God eternally. Because of our will and willful choice and disobedience, we've been disconnected and separated from God because he's holy and now sin has entered the world. And there's this disconnection. So these two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, kind of tell the beginnings of the story of the gospel. And so the third tree is the tree at the very center of the scriptures. And it's the tree of the cross of Christ. We're thinking in this Christmas time of the year about the birth of Jesus. But as we sang this morning, we, we, we remember the birth of Christ, that Christ had to be born so that he might die to pay the price for sin so that people could be free again. And so the tree of the cross, in some places in the scriptures, the cross is actually called the tree in the translation of the scripture that we're going to look at this morning. It's called the tree. So in Luke 23, it says this, and they led him being Jesus away and they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And then later in Luke 23, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And then we see in Acts 5, when Peter is talking, he says, The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. 
So this cross, which we call the tree, which is called the tree, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree, is the tree at the center of the story that makes the disconnection that happened through the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this tree of the cross makes it possible for us to be reunited and redeemed. We're talking about redeeming Christmas. This tree of the cross is the price at which we were redeemed and ransomed because there was a price that had to be paid for our sinfulness, and that price was, was death. And Jesus took that price for us. The scriptures are really clear that he made him, God made him who had no sin, that is Jesus, to be sin for us, to take on sin for us, so that we might be called the righteousness of God. So on that tree of the cross, all the, the, the penalty and the price and the payment for sin was placed on Jesus, and all his, his place in glory and and all that, that, that was in him and is in him was placed on us. His righteousness we received. This great exchange happened on the cross. And what's really beautiful about the story of Scripture is that it's very symmetrical. So this tree of life that showed up in the very beginning of the story shows up again at the very end of the story. And this is a big kind of grand arc narrative sermon but at the end of the story, we see the tree of life revisited. That, that first tree comes again at the very end of the story. So in the very last chapter of Scripture, in Revelation 22, it says this. Then the angel showed me, this is John having a vision of heaven. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So we see we're, we're reintroduced to this tree of life that, that we were separated from in glory through the payment of Christ on the cross. And this is the gospel. This is the good news for us, that, that while we were separated from life by sin, through Christ we are able to be united with life again, and not only life, but life eternal. Life that's healed. And the beautiful thing about being in Christ is that we, we can experience a, a foretaste of that here and now. We still live in a world affected by sin. There's still brokenness and hurt. There's still sickness and pain here. We know it well. Many of you come in with the effects of that near you or on you or you're experiencing that now. And yet in Christ, we can experience a foretaste of that life that is ours eternal in glory. And that is what's available to you and I through placing our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And so what we want to do, as you think about these three trees, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the cross, and then the tree of life revisited, we want to help you kind of redeem some of your Christmas tree traditions. Because the thing is, is like so often in Christmas time, we get focused on the wrong things. I was reading a devotional this week. My kind of Advent devotional is, is by John Piper. And he puts it this way. He says, do you feel restless for home? I have family coming home for the holidays. It feels good. I think the bottom line reason for why, is it, why it feels good is that they and I are destined in the depths of our being for an ultimate homecoming. All other homecomings are foretastes, and foretastes are good unless they become substitutes. Oh, don't let the sweet things of this season become substitutes of the final great all-satisfying sweetness. And so sometimes we make our, like putting up the tree and decorating the tree 
and going to see Santa Claus and making Christmas cookies and all the wonderful good things about this season, we make them the thing. We focus on those things. But what, what Piper is saying, what we want to try to, to, to tell you is that those are all just pictures of the great and most beautiful thing. And that great and beautiful thing is that Christ came, that he came not only to be born but to die, to pay the price for your sin. He came to be resurrected and be raised to life as a kind of first fruits for the life that you and I would have. And so we hope that as you're putting up your Christmas tree, if, if you've done it already, possibly you could do a few things. So here's a couple of ideas. You could use some special ornaments on your tree to kind of remind you. Our family uses this ornament. It's called the Christmas nail. It, it looks like one of the nails that may have, may have been used to, to crucify Christ, right? That, that kind of went through his hands and feet. And we remember, and you hang it kind of on a sturdy branch near the trunk of the tree because it's very heavy. And it's kind of hidden to everyone, but we know it's there. So when we put this on, it's the very first one that we put on, and it reminds us that this tree is just a picture of the tree that Christ died on. So that's something that we do in my family. You may have some special ornaments that you remember Christ by when you put it up on the tree. You could put a baby Jesus under the tree, right? Some people do that. They have like a manger and a, a, a Christ child that they, they put under the tree. You know, that's often where we, we put gifts, right? You could put the Christ child at the very center as the greatest gift for us and use that as a teachable moment. That, that third point is use the tree as a teachable moment, especially many of you are parents. I see so many young children kind of running around here. Use this time of putting up the tree and decorating the tree to tell the gospel through three trees to your kids. You should be able to communicate the gospel in the same way that I just did, using those three trees as sort of a, a storyline for the grand narrative of Scripture. It's a, it's a great way to kind of talk to your kids about the gospel of Jesus, right? And, and the last thing is we want to give you a gift um, here at the Foundry, and it's it's just a, a paper ornament that you can use, but it's got a prayer on it. And uh, I, I kind of put this prayer together as sort of a summary of this message. Um, Erica put it together and made it really beautiful. And I think Eric put these little things through. So that was his contribution, <laughs> which is probably good that uh, that, that was all that he, he was doing this. Um, it's really cool because Erica made it look like the prayer sort of in the shape of a tree, which is really cool. So on your way out this morning, we want to give this to you as a gift, one per family. And we would love for you, um, your tree's probably already up, but we'd love for you to pray this prayer together as a family. Uh, maybe have one person, maybe the father or whatever, sort of pray this prayer aloud and then put this on your tree as a reminder of of the gospel and the good news that is ours through these three trees, the story of the three trees. So I'm going to close this morning by praying the prayer that's on this card. And we'd encourage you uh, to pick one of these up on your way out. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, as we decorate our tree again this Christmas, we take a few moments to remember the significant trees in the true story of the Bible. We remember the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which Adam and Eve ate from, which allowed sin to enter the world and all people and to separate us from you, and that also separated us from that other tree in Eden, the tree of life. We remember the tree that made the cross that your son Jesus died upon to pay the price for sin and to reunite us with you through our faith in him. And finally, we remember that same tree of life from the beginning of this story that we see show up in the end of the story that will bring healing to the nations and eternal life with you in heaven. As we look upon our beautiful tree again this season, 
We choose as a family to redeem Christmas by focusing on your son, Jesus, and focusing less on what's on or under our tree. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Receive God's blessing. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the power and presence of his Holy Spirit rest on you this day and remain with you forever. Go in peace.